Thank you very much, uh, Christoph, for the nice introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here and to, to meet again with some of you who we haven't met for the last period and also have new faces. So today, as uh, well as Christoph said, I have been in Sikam for some time, but now I'm back in Barcelona. So that's the historical building and a nice view of the city. And I will talk about active systems. I guess for a number of you, you know what these are. Act active systems at the end in very general terms from the interest of uh, for a physical perspective are systems where the essential or the relevant elements are able to convert uh, internal energy into mechanical work. And obviously the uh, natural um, inspiration comes from nature. And I think that all of you have seen these movies with uh, these flocks of uh, starlings and trying to understand how without a clear leader, uh, they can self-organize. We can do this in the lab. Uh, these are uh, quinker colloids that basically break symmetry, start moving together, and they can form this um, number of interesting patterns. And also, they're at an intermediate scale. You can, I don't, I'm sure you will have also seen these robots, small robots of a few millimeters, centimeters, that basically they only send signals to the neighbors to decide what to do. Uh, and that's enough if uh, uh, the rules are appropriate to form uh, self-organized in uh, intricate and, and non-trivial structures. I will simply wait to see. So these are the, the type of objects that move around uh, with a small motor. And this has uh, led also to open uh, a number of uh, challenges in how we can use this system to create new materials. Here I show you, for example, uh, these are active emulsions. So these are drops in which the surface is, is covered by microtubules. They are active and then they can uh, generate new type of emulsion. So for example, in microfluidic uh, systems, one can, uh, this is not working anymore, but okay. So these are uh, bacteria that then they can be used to, uh, to make the uh, fluid flow or to decide how to organize flows uh, in microfluidic, at the microfluidic scale. Now you can see them rotate. And um, I will not go into many uh, details about this, but I, I, I like at least to remind, to make it clear how different these systems are from driven systems, uh, because uh, uh, into how they can s uh, structure, this is already a relatively old but nice experiment by Galashda et al, where they had bacteria that they could uh, uh, make it green fluorescently, and then they put them in a, in a box. Uh, with a set of uh, um, obstacles that were aligned and <coughs> sorry, <coughs> such that the typical size of these boxes, uh, uh, of, of these obstacles is comparable to the typical run length of, the, of this E. coli. And as a result, I mean, there is no obvious attraction or repulsion. They're essentially like hardcore objects that move around. And if it could be equilibrium, you would see the whole box uniformly painted in green. And here, rather, what you see is that the bacteria self-trap them on the right-hand side, and that is associated with the fact that the motion is, I mean, on large distances they diffuse, but they don't satisfy digital balance, and, and that's enough to make them uh, sort of collect. And, and now if you think that in, instead of having one, you could have like two of these set of obstacles put together, you could end up in a system where bacteria would enter from bottom to up top, and then here would go from right to left. So you would have a state in which naturally you would need a flux. And once you have a flux, you can use that to retrieve work out of it. And again, that's a, a nice reverse experiment of uh, Di Leonardo, where uh, here the bacteria move around this wheel. And again, in this case, the asymmetry is because the, 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 uh, the, the shape of, the, of this wheel is asymmetric with respect to this characteristic distance the bacteria work and uh, this uh, display sorry and in this case it will rotate so you could extract work out of it it's very inefficient but that's uh, a challenge yeah so that's a way to to that in which we can extract uh, make use of, of what it is so and and that's the particles by themselves the bacteria by themselves there is nothing that is driving them and this has important uh, consequences in, in terms of how these particles can self-assemble out of equilibrium. And in the case of, uh, I've been talking about bacteria, but microorganisms that can swim, or even inside the cells, 
you can have molecular motors that move along and that can give rise to ways to generate flows that have important metabolic uh, in, uh, uh, consequences. So uh, this, this is clearly, I mean, these systems are clearly interesting in themselves and have properties that distinguish them from other more traditional non-equilibrium driven systems. So what I will, uh, would like to, to uh, go today is to, to talk about, show you simple models and what we can learn from them in terms of the basic physical properties of these systems, how they self-organize and what features are relevant and how we can try to characterize or classify them. And I will follow sort of like, on, we'll show you cases in which uh, there is, in many cases at small scales, these object elements are in a solvent, so the coupling to the fluid is relevant. I show you how these motors can generate flows inside cells in the previous movie, uh, the previous uh, slide. But um, I will consider, I mean, in the jargon, uh, people talk of dry system of wet, whether one takes into account the fact that these particles, these objects are not in vacuum, but they are in a medium, and because they are in equilibrium, the coupling to the medium is non-trivial. And I will also talk about the relevance of particle shapes and steric interactions on, on simple dry uh, models. So in that sense, I will structure the presentation in three parts. First, I will talk about the role of symmetries in emerging uh, phases. Then I will talk about specifically diffusophoresis, one particular uh, self-propelling mechanism that is relevant for, uh, for college, so is used in the lab to create systems that are well controlled on which we can test and see how they behave. And if time permits, I also would like to end up with a couple of examples to show you the relevance of hydrodynamics, the fact that because there is a solvent, when these objects move around, they generate flows. And these flows, because they have long range correlations, uh, play also a role in, in, in generating these dynamic medium mediated interactions that also control how they behave collectively. So, I will start with a simple model. I'm sure you have seen this, uh, probably. I mean, it's quite, which is the, what is called the active Brownian particle. So, if we want to understand something, we can take Brownian motion. We all know what Brownian motion is, how Brownian particles move around, and try to include this ingredient that, because of whatever process, now these particles are able to self-propel. So, you can take, in the Overdam limit, Brownian motion, so the diffusion motion of the particles is determined by Fi or whatever are the conservative interactions between particles. You can have a diffusion, thermal diffusion coefficient, and then each now each sphere has a vector n that determines the direction in which they will move, and they will do that at constant speed v0. And uh, so that's something quite, I mean, I think it's not difficult to propose something like this. And, and now the, the point, uh, the, the activity, if you want to enter through this self propelling velocity and through the fact that now this vector will randomly move. And then I will be showing you mostly 2D results. So can parameterize this unit vector in terms of an angle. And then you simply have a Brownian motion diffusion for the angle. That's it. Um, that's uh, enough. Here you can just uh, break detail balance in how these uh, particles move, and then this has very deep consequences. So imagine that you have hard spheres. We know hard spheres will come and collide. Uh, activity will change the collision because now when they collide, even if you have an elastic collision, still the direction of propulsion will keep on bring me back to where it was before. So the particles will have a stronger tendency to keep on colliding until this direction, this intrinsic self-propelling direction will be a, will have the time to diffuse away. So these are like stubborn spheres that keep on colliding. And the nice thing here of this a model like that is that we can identify what are the relevant dimensionless parameters. So we'll have the concentration or the density or volume fraction. And then out of here, you can extract uh, one dimensional coefficient that is called the active Peclet number. This is essentially a, a ratio between the time they take these particles to diffuse away from the time it takes to move over, over the, their own system size. So when this peclet is large, it means that they are keep on trying to move for a long time because uh, of co covering, say, longer distances bef before they decorrelate. And then there is also a ratio between how strong 
I mean, this is brain diffusion, so you can, brain emotion, you can extract an effective force associated to self propulsion and compared to the force of the, uh, of the uh, interactions. And here, that's another, I mean, it tells you the particles can, are able to cross each other or not. I will always be in the case that we have hard spheres, so they will never cross. So at the end, have two parameters, the Peckley number and concentration. So we can map the behavior, the, the nice thing of, of simple models, and now we can map up. We know that we have a, an effective two-dimensional phase diagram. And again, this is an old paper by Redner that visualized it. And, and this is a movie where in each square, you see uh, the simulation changing density and changing the propulsion speed. And what you can see is that if we are a relatively intermediate dense regions and speed is large enough, then the system phase separates into a high, a large dense phase that coexists with a gas that's called motility induced phase separation because in equilibrium that could not take place. Yeah? Uh, so you can then write down the draw, say the, the phase diagram and typically then they identify that there is like a critical value, Peckler number above which we will have this coexistence. And this is similar or rem reminiscent of what we know from, co from condensation in equilibrium. Uh, wh what we looked at then was what happens if, so this is again the same diagram, but now, uh, okay, it's turned around because of how we publish it, but okay, we hope you can see here the Peckler number in logarithmic scale and the concentration. This is two dimensions. So I was talking about this behavior here, the coexistence, so gray, or gray is the coexistence region, but, but we know that if I go to Peckler zero, so no activity, go back to hard disks in equilibrium. And we know that we have a phase separation because hard disks will have a disordered fluid phase, a solid phase, the orange, and then in between there will be an emetic phase, uh, sorry, an exotic phase as well. So, I mean, this is very tiny in this phase diagram. So this, the inset is, an, uh, is, is like a, a zoom of the region where now blue here is the, is the exotic, the exotic here is very narrow, but okay, if you are patient enough, then we can sort of map up and try to understand. We were wondering how the exotic, I mean, the, the, the phase transitions the, that we know in equilibrium, how they would look like if we would now move up to, the, to, the, um, to this uh, motility induced phase separation. What you can see is that essentially activity favors disorder. So all disordered phases are moved to larger uh, concentrations, uh, area fractions, uh, but then at some point they will merge. So they will be here at a triple point. So you will have here the uh, liquid, I mean, these MIPS that I was des describing would be a fluid gas or a liquid gas, but then at some point would be a gas exotic or a gas solid. Um, the, this uh, is uh, kind of like, you can say then that, that MIPS is as an intrinsic out of equilibrium transition because it's not like a clear, extension of what we know in equilibrium. Actually, when we decided to do that is because there was previous work by Cugliandolo et al. that she had, they had been working with dimers. So no discs, but two discs really joined together with a stiff spring. And they were suggesting that for, for these discs, the, so again, this is the equivalent type of phase diagram where you, you can see that in this case, that's where MIPS type transition is expected to, to happen. And their, their estimate is that in that case, the, what would be the equilibrium phase transition was sort of like broadening. And, and therefore here, uh, it's, it's still less clear how one should understand this interaction be between these two types of, of, of uh, transitions. And I think this is a good example to show that shape can has a profound effect in these phase transitions out of equilibrium. Yes. <laughs> I didn't, so I, I, sh I show the results. I mean, uh, so this was a very, I mean, especially Lino here spent a lot of effort because indeed we had to, I mean, we did this as you would do in equilibrium. So we have to identify what is the order parameter and try to identify that. So for, for, for these MIPS, we use, uh, I mean, we use the pressure, the consistent and the densities, but then we had also the usual, the standard order parameter for exotic solid or for the liquid exotic. So, yeah. 
No, no, we, we try to compute pressure, for example, and then look at the, at the Maxwell construction and combine that with the histograms of, the, of local concentrations to identify coexistence, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we allow it to develop. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a Brownian dynamics simulation that we run and then see what happens. Yes. Yes, in boxes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we also look at defects. And again, this was interesting because the, the cost of the established theory predicts that there is an unbinding. I mean, this, this uh, solid exotic and then exotic uh, fluid. Uh, are, can be understood as transitions where there are unbinding of dislocations and disclinations. So again, we learn to identify dislocations, disclinations, and that's a bit of an effort. But and and then there is a prediction of how this number of defects should uh, depend on the distance to the critical concentration where the transition takes place. And and there is even a prediction for these exponents mu, which is different for the two of them. So here is. For the solid exotic, so this is the density of defects. So in this case, are the, the, the dislocations, and then so these dislocations, and then you can see how they grow, and we could fit this to to this uh, to the theoretical operation, so it's consistent. When we went to the liquid exotic, it is less obvious. Again, you can get something. I mean, it's difficult to get decades, so it's a question of how much you believe about them. But when we start looking at at where where because we we could run large systems with uh, then have a quite a large number of these defects what we saw is that at the end visually defects tend to cluster so rather than just restrict ourselves to this uh, theory we look at the cluster size distribution of these defects and actually the transition between exotic and, and the fluid seemed to correspond to a percolation transition so this this cluster size distribution became power law with an exponent two, so it was consistent with that. That's not how, and, and also what we saw is that we could do that in equilibrium, and then we, as we changed the Peckley number, we didn't change the quality, we didn't see or identify qualitative change in how these defects proliferate. So, and we couldn't find in the literature a clear discussion of this exotic liquid or equilibrium hard disks in terms of a percolation transition. So still, the connection between the two, to us, is a bit still not, not clear, but uh, it was uh, quite, I mean, these were also quite long, large simulations to try to get uh, decent statistics systematically. So I think that's uh, an interesting way to, to look at it, at least for a different way to understand this, this uh, transition between the exotic and the liquid. And I'm going to, yes, and I wanted to then show you, as a, I, I refer about the effect of the shape, I will not go back to the particular case of the dimers that I was telling you before, but again, w working on this uh, Brownian dynamic uh, framework that I was telling you, we look at uh, how shape affects the phases, considering a minimal change. So still we take hard disks, so the particles are isotropic, but now there is an, an aligning interaction between their vectors, they have a vector, a direction, so we introduce a Kuramoto-like interaction, so each particle now will try to align with all the neighbor ones according to a sign, so it's minimal when, when they are aligned, so the sign is zero, and again, there is a particular interaction range, I mean, these, these are things that one has to tweak co co correctly, but will not affect anything of what I will be telling you. The nice thing is that we have the same that we had before, the position of the particles diffuse and then propel. The angle now doesn't contains not only the random term, but then this, this alignment. So we have another relevant parameter, which is now the ratio between this K, the, the strength of this um, Kuramoto interaction will tell us the typical time in which these two particles will align. And we can compare that time to the time they take to decorrelate because of the random term. So that's another parameter we call G. So when G is very small, essentially we go back to the random uh, de uh, decorrelation of the aligning of the, the self-propelling direction of the disks. When G is very large, then they are very effective at, at aligning. Um, 
Because there are disks, we avoid having to take care of anything that has to do with steric interactions and tendency to form uh, in equilibrium uh, mesogenic phases. What we see now, so we have now a three-dimensional space, which is a bit more difficult to, to draw than before. So again, so here I do a cut at a particular concentration. Now you can have to imagine that there are a number of cuts of these graphs at different concentrations of the particles. Uh, here we are below MIPS. So, uh, and, and then typically what we observe is that, again, if G is very small, we go back to the active Brownian particles I was telling you before. And in this case, essentially, we have a disordered system. And as we increase G, what we observed was that a, a characteristic value of alignment that doesn't depend very much on activity, there is a transition from a disordered phase to a flocking, where now the particles will move uh, al uh, together. And actually, here are snapshots of what we have here at, in D, C, D. So these are different uh, positions uh, in, in this phase diagram. Typically, now color means the orientation of the particle. So here you can see that they tend to form clusters that all of them sort of like go, align uh, together, or here macroscopically there is a net directionality of motion, so they move together. This is uh, reminiscent, if you want, of, of the starlings I was showing you at the beginning. It's also reminiscing, I don't know if you've heard of the big check model, which was introduced in 95 to describe this type of systems where you break Galilean invariance in the sense that you have initially a system where particles move around, so there is no net directionality, and then uh, they start moving along. Uh, because of the hardcore interaction, the type of structures that they form, again, eh, we use the corresponding order parameters to characterize them. Uh, I wanted to say that once we are in this flocking phase, we observe two different type of morphologies because it could be that either, the, depending on how stubborn they are on the pecle, they can, here, here on the right hand side, you see red means particles moving horizontally and green moving vertically. So here you have a structure that is vertical but here on the right hand side, the particles are oriented perpendicular. So it's really what is called a band. So it's really propagating because they are all pushing. And the concentration here in the front is typically larger than in the, in the back. But there is also a possibility that they, if they are not stubborn enough, that then they align along this band. That's what we call a lane, because now you have to think that particles are moving, uh, in this case, up. But then the motion uh, transversally is uh, a random uh, diffusive uh, motion or dispersion of the band. So this is just to show, yes. Yeah. Uh, so I would say one thing is the tendency to form these uh, structures and these uh, structures are as large as the system size. Okay, now this is intrinsic to this system. Because they are large, span the system size, they are very sensitive to boundary conditions. Yeah, so yes, it, it depends on the shape. What is the nature of these bands in terms of, of how the system behaves or what you would call like a phase um, is something controversial, yeah? so. I wouldn't be able to give you, so yes, I would expect, so it's, it's difficult to say, to me it's difficult to, to indicate how to characterize the system because typically what you see is this type of structures, sometimes is, I mean, can be a band, can be an object, but it can be an object and then breaks and reforms. What is the asymptotic limit if you think now in going infinite is something that, yeah, it's uh, an interesting question, yes. I, So, so, yeah, I mean, if, if you keep, if you dilute the system, then yes, it's a different, so this is, what I'm showing you is for a given density, okay? And then the question is, for a given density, if now I go infinite, what happens? And that in itself is also an interesting question. Yeah, yeah but I mean, is there one band? There will be more bands, the band has a width, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, okay. I don't think that all this, at least to my knowledge, is completely understood yet. Yeah. 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 
Ja, ja, yes. Mhm. Yes, exactly. So, so that's, that's why I was calling this Kuramoto, because I was thinking more in, when you think in Kuramoto, you think that there is a characteristic strength that you came to keep and not uh, change A depending on how you choose the, rate, the range of interaction, but I agree. So wh when I talk about big check, actually it's like a big word, no? because big check introduced the model, but then there are a whole families, and then what are the features that characterize the behavior or the phase diagrams or regimes for different type of big check interactions is also non-trivial, yes. I agree. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. I think there was a question there. Yeah. I think no, because of, of the type of parameters we are in, but I've never, I haven't looked at that systematically, so th I, th I think that's an interesting question. It would deserve a, a separate, uh, but that in a way, we see this as a relatively um, robust feature. It's not that we have to tune, I think for the chimera it's a bit more specific of the range of parameters, but uh, maybe there's a connection. I didn't explore that, yeah, okay. I mean, to some extent, I, I discuss this as if it goes a kind of like a phase diagram, but it's really a dynamical non-equilibrium state, and then, yeah, all these issues are become non-trivial when you start, we want to understand them in, in detail. Yeah. Okay, so um, I wanted to talk now, uh, so in these two parts, so here is are what I was calling these dry models that are very simple, they really built on what we know from reference basic statistical mechanical models where we can learn a lot and make connections to all what we know from uh, equilibrium statistical physics. Uh, here I wanted to bring another element which is the fact that, as I said, eh, in many cases when we look at uh, self-propelling or active elements that are small, they are in a medium and then as they are intrinsically out of equilibrium, the coupling, the dynamical coupling to the medium is, is relevant and that gives rise to medium, long range medium mediated interactions that have a strong effect. So I don't know how long I will manage to get, but I'll, at least I wanted to show you or discuss uh, a, a set of reference equilibrium, um, sorry, experimental systems that are based on colloidal particles uh, that exploit uh, for eases. So basically, uh, there are of different nature, but you, you have to think in a colloidal particle that uh, that has a heterogeneous surface. For example, half the surface is covered by platinum, as here. Sometimes they put an enzyme, they put a catalyzer that will favor uh, the reaction uh, of uh, in presence of the reactants. And because there is this uh, uh, inhomogeneity, if the reaction happens only say on part of this surface, as a result there will be gradients of reactants and products over the particle length. If these gradients and products are interacting with the colloid, then this leads to what is known as uh, diffuse of phoresis. So the particle will move, and phoresis is something that is known in, in physical chemistry for a long time. If you put a, if you put a chemical concentration, and you have a particle that attracts, say, the chemical because the concentration is not uniform of the particle surface that gives rise to pressure gradients that push the particle. Here, this is done not by imposing an external gradient, but just by the chemical reaction itself. So in that sense, it's called self-diffuser phoresis, okay? And, and then, if you, if you don't want to describe the chemical uh, the chemistry in detail, you can describe this in terms of an effective uh, slip velocity or surface velocity on the particle that will depend on the concentration gradient and the mobility, okay? And if this mobility is uh, positive, uh, then the particle will move toward regions where there is more chemicals. If it is negative, it will move away. I will not, um, so I will show you some experiments and then how we model them and what we observe. But I wanted at least to, to make a point. I mean, th this is 
how we normally think about it. That's it. Eh? So the basically, in a way, there is a gradient. Something important is that because if you think in the reactants and products, as this particle is consuming, say, a reactant, it's like a sink. It will generate, uh, since the concentration of the chemical in the medium is conserved, it will lead to a 1 over R profile. So the concentration around this colloid is not uniform. Decays algebraically. So if you imagine that there is a second one around it, then there will be the second one, even if it wouldn't be reacting, will will see this gradient and can react theoretically to it. So this means that these particles that are dispersed in this medium will see each other over relatively long distances, and that leads to a what I, that's what I refer as a medium uh, control reaction. Yeah. Um, something that that is non-trivial uh, that may be also relevant, although I will not explore it here too much, is that as the particle moves, I mean, as I said, no, in this axisymmetric uh, geometry, it will generate a gradient. There can be more particles here than there, for example. So if, if it's producing the chemical here, but then it is, from the point of view of the phoretic interaction, the, this, this part is repelling the chemical and it's attracting here. Particle is moving, it's creating a chemical, but then it's repelling, I mean, it's, it's, it's like getting into the region that it doesn't like. So if there is a fluctuation, uh, then these forces that are uh, there on the particle surface because of this interaction with the chemical will not be balanced anymore. And then if, in, in this case in which this is negative, then the, this gradient here is larger because then it's more exposed to the direction in which the chemical is changing. And, and that will give a torque, and since the, it's torque free, if there is a, like a torque in the medium, it has to be the opposite torque in the particle, and that can sort of like be uh, sort of feedback uh, leading to the possibility of generating an instability. So I will not describe this here, but even particles that are axisymmetric, that on average generate an axisymmetric profile, can become unstable and start rotating. So they can become I mean, spontaneously chiral. And that's also, again, an effect of the coupling to the medium. Not only the interaction, but the nature of their motion may become, so may break the symmetry that it has intrinsically due to a hydrodynamic instability. Um, however, what, what I wanted to show because of some experiments is another type of particles that are active due to cell diffusophoresis, which in principle you may think it's a bit stupid because, I mean, these are experiments done in Barcelona in the, in the laboratory of Pietro Tierno. He consider he takes particles that are that they decompose oxygen peroxide, but because of the shape and and their weight, the the catalytic part that will decompose the oxygen peroxide tends to be facing towards a wall. So they sediment because they are relatively heavy and they are a few larger than a few microns, and and then they will decompose. But if you think of one isolated particle, it's, it's a bit stupid because it's, it's really hitting against the wall. No? Because I mean, it's, it, it decomposes and because of the mobility, it would move towards down. So basically, because it's, uh, it's um, I mean, it's, there will be the random motion, so the directionality will fluctuate a bit, so they will diffuse around. So this is a particle that is active, but is not propelling. It's apolar. It turns out that experimentally it's interesting because it's easier to keep them on the under the microscope because they don't move around away. So in that sense, they could do experiments for longer, but an, an isolated particle does nothing. However, if you think now in another one that is nearby, then these two particles will interact through this medium mediated uh, interaction that I was telling you because there are these chemical fields. And, and then, um, but actually they mixed these active particles with uh, passive silica colloids, but these silica colloids react or they, they have a, a phoretic response to uh, oxygen peroxide, so then they sort of approach each other. And so this is, uh, if you take two of them, what they looked at is then that they, are, they came closer, the distance became, so they attract. This is because of this mobility that I was telling you uh, helps to attract each other. And when they attract each other, if you look at the center of mass, then they will start propelling. So now each individual particle doesn't propel, but now they approach chemically and the, 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 they form a dimer, and this dimer can propel because now they, it breaks symmetry. 
So they looked in detail at, I mean, sometimes, I mean, obviously I, I said a dimer, if concentration is larger, sometimes they form uh, aggregates of a different number of particles of uh, silica and active particles, and they could compute the velocities. Something they, look, they, they realize is that the directionality of the velocity could change. It could be that sometimes the active particles were in the front and sometimes were in the back. And basically, we looked from a theoretical side, we solved the chemical, the problem of, of what is the distribution of the chemical around, this is the, optic, the active particle that will generate a concentration of a, of a product, say, and then we looked at what is the effective uh, motion, assuming that the, there is a slip velocity, as I said, that is the mobility times the grain, so you can solve for it and actually the velocity of a dimer as a function of the ratio, depending on, on how large the passive and the active particle are, uh, when this is zero, it can go be positive or negative. And basically, I mean, the comparison is I mean, quantitative with experiments. So we could at least understand that the relative ratio, uh, size of the active and the passive particle was a determinant factor that would tell which particle would be in, in, in front or in the back. And um, something else we did then is because we then could compute theoretically within this model the velocity of, of an active and a passive particle, we could um, sort of like for pairs of particles, as I told you, they could compute the relative velocity as a function of their distance. So we could, we had expressions for, for these velocities as a function of the separation between the active and the passive particle or two active particles. And then we could fit them to, to the experimental data to calibrate our uh, effective velocity. So out of there, we could uh, compute or propose a Brownian dynamic model where now we have these active and passive particles that will move only if they are in presence of each other with this relative velocity that I didn't emphasize, but decays algebraically because it's related to this uh, long range profile of the chemical around them. So it essentially, it's an algebraic uh, relative velocity, it's Brownian dynamics, so you could say it's a relative force if you multiply or divide by the mobility, okay? So you can put this into a model. Now there is no self-propulsion, so it's only the positions of the particles with these effective interactions. And in the experiments, uh, as, as I tell you, told you, these particle sediments, so now you have this silica and active particles forming a monolayer, they can visualize them. And something that also they do experimentally is that the efficiency of this catalyzer uh, depends on the wavelength uh, on which they light the system. So they have a way to switch the system on and off. So basically they put the particles and then when they switch the, the light, then they become active. The, the essentially this, the, 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 this ellipsoids, the magnetic, these ellipsoids will become active. So you will be seeing, so this is what they see in the experiment. So the light large spheres are the silica particles and the smaller darker ones are the active particles and that's an initial image so they deposit randomly when they switch the light on then they form these aggregates where i don't know yeah where if you look a bit more in detail the active particles tend to be more in the center also uh, and then the passive ones aggregate around them and basically, if you now change the concentration of the silica or of the, uh, of the active particles, then there is a, a sort of like a, a phase diagram where they observe clusters of different sorts. Something I didn't emphasize, the, these active particles, because of how they are made, they, they have a, a magnetic dipole. So we also calibrated this magnetic dipole. This means that when, when you have many of these active particles, they tend to form chains. I think you see here this elongated the structures, this is the magnetic character which has an influence in the morphology of this, of this uh, uh, assembly. So they can form clusters. Uh, so typically if the passive component is dominant, or typically you will see clusters that will end up uh, coalescing. When you have a larger amount of these active ones, then they will form also these clusters that tend to be more elongated and then they form structures that percolate, that we call a gel, that can sample over all the system. And then when you are in this region, you can see that you have these gels and eventually they will form something that is more like a glass, okay? And these are just images for the calibrated parameters between 
experiments on the right on the left and then the simulation so we could sort of like do a semi quantitative comparison and we also computed the uh, the, the relaxation time, the intermediate scattering functions to characterize, I mean, when we talk about gel is because these were phases where the dynamics was very, very slow. Maybe I have five minutes. I can show you, um, maybe I can, I can show you then also in this case, again, if this is motivated by these experiments in Barcelona with magnetic particles, um, where they now, what I've shown you are self diffuse aphoretic and the magnetic interaction was secondary. It had an influence in the morphology. Now here, what, what they did, what I will show you now are particles that are not phoretic. So now phoresis is not important. Uh, and rather now these are magnetic particles which are subject to an oscillatory magnetic field. So this is strictly speaking, sometimes it's, it's, it's called as driven instead of uh, actuated, sorry, instead of active because there is an, an external forcing, but on average, the magnetic field is zero because it's a circularly polarized, but a rotating magnetic field. Now, the point is that if you, if you make this magnetic field rotate and then you have these magnetic particles, uh, they will rotate and they put them on, on what is called a garnet field, so a film. So this is a substrate in which, which has a magnetic pattern uh, and therefore there is an effective attraction of the particles to this pattern. So this magnetic field has a strong impact into, uh, as the magnetic field rotates, this garnet substrate now generates, uh, becomes a, a traveling wave in which, because they, these domains are being displaced. And basically, if the frequency at which the rotation is low enough, basically the colors that are on top will be, if you want, locked on these domains that are moving along because they also have a magnetic coupling to the substrate and they will be uh, moving along. That's the velocity that you see here. But obviously when the frequency starts being too high, then because of the friction of the fluid, they cannot keep up and then they slip. So they start sort of jumping and then they move at a velocity that is smaller than the velocity of this wave, if you want, of this magnetic wave. And for a single particle, this can, I mean, this has been studied, it's characterized, and, and there is even a, a, an expression of how this velocity changes with the uh, friction. So um, if you have, instead of one, many, then uh, depending on the, on, on the ellipticity, so one thing is the frequency, the other is ellipticity, how important is the, 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 the horizontal or the vertical component of the magnetic field, because that also leads to an effective interaction. These are now two dipoles that are rotating, depending if they spend more time aligned, or I mean, two, two magnetic dipoles perpendicular repel each other, but if they're aligned, they attract. So there is an effective attraction or repulsion, and therefore they form, uh, they can form uh, long trains. Now, what we what they observe experimentally is that the if they are if they were in the asynchronous regime so particles individually cannot keep up but now they change the concentration for a given set of parameters of the driving field what they observe typically is that the particles increase their velocity and become synchronous again so in a way they are able to recover synchrony uh, collectively and in order to understand that we also again uh, propose a Brownian dynamic model where here we have again the velocity, we have the external force that we, I mean, there, there is a model into what is the effective coupling of an individual particle to the substrate uh, that is moving along. And then there are the dipolar interactions, then there are steric interactions. And, and then we also introduce the fact that when they move, because they're in a liquid, they will generate a flow. So if one particle is moving, it generates a flow around it, and now this flow would also can push another one. Uh, again, the flow, because this is low Reynolds number, is uh, algebraic, in the case as one over R squared. So again, particles that are far away can interact, in this case, hydrodynamically instead of chemically, as I shown you before. And actually solving, in this case, then doing simulations in villages, we can switch on in and on the hydrodynamic or the dipolar on the steric, what we found is that in the absence of hydrodynamic interactions, which are these curves here, when you increase the surface density, the velocity decreases, which is what you would expect naively, you know, if there is hindering between them, it's even more difficult to keep up with the forcing. 
but the hydrodynamic, on the other hand, bro brought them back to the synchrony. And actually, it, it's even possible to find out uh, a simple model where you can work out in one dimension what happens. And the idea in simple terms is that as these particles are moving, because they generate this flow, the flow helps to advect nearby one. So if I am moving along and then the other is uh, idle, then my motion will help it to move. And that, in a way, counterbalances this friction that I was telling you and allows them to be uh, able to go together in synchrony for frequencies where isolated they are not able to, to move along. Um, and then this hydrodynamic interactions also explains that, for example, they observe uh, structures that are relatively more uh, locally uh, with higher density than if you would, I mean, in the absence of hydrodynamic interactions, uh, and if we are, I mean, this is for this case in which they tend to form these uh, chains. So without hydrodynamics, you would expect them to align in chains and rather the transverse, I mean, here we have these domains, magnetic domains, then they, they form much more compact uh, structures. And I will simply finish, maybe that's, uh, uh, I would think I'll finish here. So there's another example of hydrodynamic coupling in this case through magnetic rotors, but I think that's, that's enough. So uh, I think at least I make the point, the importance of hydrodynamic interaction. So I hope you, I've shown you why active materials are particularly different from other type of driven systems. And I've talked about the importance of these simple models and also the relevance of uh, medium interacting uh, uh, interactions, medium mediated interactions in the emergence of uh, uh, non-equilibrium long range assemblies. As I've told you of a few examples, this has been done by different people. The experiments, as I mentioned, were done by Pietro Tierno in Barcelona and Elena, who is now in Sapienza. The first part of simulations of model systems were done by Elena uh, and when he, she did her PhD in, at SICAM and, and Demian in Barcelona and the interaction part has been done with by Sergi and Joan Codina, a PhD and a postdoc uh, of mine. And thank you very much for your attention.